just finished telling about the man who changed the chicken livers to a profit basis. Yeah. I was saying it was a pleasure serving as a, a district manager for Small Rock Plants Corporation, which covers all of Oklahoma and the Panhandle of Texas. It was a worthwhile idea. After the war, I uh, finally made up my mind that I was going to learn to fly. And I went to Vernon Westbrook and asked him if he thought he could teach a man with one arm to fly. And Vernon said, well, of course you could. So, in a short while, I had my pilot's license and enjoyed flying for a long time. I don't fly now. I'm reaching the age where it's well to give up flying. I'm past 70. And, uh, but we enjoyed it for a long time. And it gave me... Uh, an insight into aviation that I'd never thought much about before. And my wife and myself were busy in real estate here in Oklahoma City after the war. When uh, in January 1952, the city manager, at that time it was Ross Taylor, asked me if I would come out to Will Rogers and take over the job of airport managers. Was there, was there a considerable competition for this position? I don't think there's too much. Uh, it was the point of, there were other people seeking the job. And uh, I saw it, I sought the job too. I mean, I did everything I thought would be wise for me to do in order to secure the appointment. But I accepted, not knowing anything about airport management, I accepted the job as an administrative challenge. It was a challenge to me to come out here and try to administer this job in such a way that it would operate as a business somewhat similar to what I've been doing in real estate where I came from and during my years of World War II as a district manager for Small War Pass Corporation. I was just operated as a business. Did you, uh, did you seek to, I take it you had a different philosophy from the philosophy that had managed uh, the airport before? Well, I think any two men have different philosophies. Uh, yes, I was determined that I would set this up on a business basis, make it pay for itself, and uh, try to earn some money for the city and to build a, a better airport. Uh, when I came, the total revenue for the airport, total gross revenue for the airport was $128,000 a year. Uh, last June 30, this, this June 30, 1967, the gross revenue would be about $1,300,000. That's quite a growth. Well, it's a uh, big growth in the past. <coughs> 16, 17 years, 16 years, and uh, it's come a long way. Could you uh, trace the uh, uh, development of the uh, airports? The airport undoubtedly now is uh, much more sophisticated and probably bigger, uh, as you just said, a much bigger operation and so forth. Was you trace the improvements that were made? Yes, in the old day, immediately after World War II and during World War II, 
Airports were run basically by men who operated hangars and uh, conducted flying schools, put on air shows. Not that too much emphasis was given for the business operation, the profit and loss angle of, an air, of a business. They were not inclined to think along that line. I came out of real estate, I came out of business, not out of flying. I uh, was taught to fly just about the time I came to the airport. So I didn't have that instilled in my uh, way of doing things as well as some other people. Uh, as soon as I came, I tried to set everything up on a business basis so that it would reflect a good business-like operation, and I also wanted everybody that worked for me to give an honest day's work. I didn't want them to misappropriate any of the property that belonged to the airports, which in turn belonged to the city, and uh, I tried to build my organization along those lines. When I came out, that we had uh, about 32, 34 people working for us. Today, we have about 128. You refer to misappropriation of of money. Would you uh, care to comment on the? Uh, I understand that there was something you had to take action on, something to do with gasoline at one time. Well, yes, I did, and uh, I tried to. They, I tried to point out to our folks that it would be improper for them to to misappropriate any money or misappropriate taken for their own good any property that belongs to the city, including automotive gasoline, automotive and aviation fuel. Well. Our fuel, fuel gallonage would not balance. It always came up short. So I made uh, a point to go and get, uh, get my people together and talk to them and try to tell them it was wrong to take for their use and for their good anything, oh, even though it was only a nickel's worth. And I was pleased not to do it. I did that three times, but I couldn't stop it. The gasoline was continually coming up short. What the men were doing, they inherited a way of life that uh, they really didn't think probably that it was wrong, but it, that it had been done before them and been handed down to them. And it developed that what they were doing was a weekend came, they would back their cars up to the gasoline pump and fill it up so they have fuel, so they have gasoline in the tank for the weekend driving. We finally, I went to the chief of police, told him what my problem was. He said, I've got some men who are just graduating from detective school, <clears throat> and I'll send one of them out, and you can process him like you're hiring them into your department. That's what we did. We got the detective out here, and he got some records and some evidence on a large group of people. Once it started at noon, I called in 23 of those 34 employees and fired them for taking property belonging to the city, which was gasoline. Did this present any kind of a crisis or anything for you, having to dismissed nearly two-thirds of your people, I guess. Well, it sure did, because, it, as you say, it dismissed uh, two-thirds of my employees. I didn't know how my city manager was going to take the news. And I told him, I said, well, I've just fired 23. Now, if you want to, you can fire me. And he said, no. He thought I'd done right. 
when I told him about firing all these people, firing the city employees. It caused quite a funeral. It was really a matter in your case of sticking by your guns, I That's guess. That's right. I had to. Uh, well, I would imagine that there are some inside stories on what you had to do to uh, get uh, the money appropriated to wherever it comes from uh, to have made the improvements that have been made. I know I read one story about you and Mr. Gill uh, getting money from the FFA, I think it was, on one occasion. Yes. <clears throat> Before we had such things as bond issues, uh, we were completely broke. We had no money to do anything with. And about that time, the Congress in Washington passed a law saying that they would match money with municipalities such as Oklahoma City for the purpose of developing airports, terminal buildings, build hangars, build runways. Uh, we didn't have any money, and the restaurant at that time, and still is, was being operated by Scott Jeff, a subsidiary of the American Airlines with headquarters in New York City. And uh, they had wanted us to improve their dining facility over in the old terminal. But we had no money to do it with. And I said to Mr. Newt Wilson, the president of Skyshare, well, what about spending your money? So, after thinking the matter over, he decided to appropriate $200,000 and hire a contractor and get the restaurant modified. It was at this time that the Congress passed the Federal Aid to Airports Program called FAP, Federal Aid to Airport Program, where they would match money with the local government. Bill Gill was city manager. I suggested to Bill that we go up to New York City and see Mr. Wilson and see if he would uh, give us the $200 to pay off the contractor who was building the modifications of the restaurant. Mr. Wilson said, but he'd be glad to do it, said somebody had to pay him, so it might, might as well be us. We took the $200,000 and stopped by FAA in Washington on our way back to New York, who were looking for projects to start on an airport. And we said to FAA, look, we've got $200,000 here, you want a message? So they said, yes, we'd be glad to. And that's the way we got the ticketing concourse, part of the ticketing concourse built in the old terminal. And the baggage claim room was built on that with the same money. Then we had an effort to pass some bonds, airport bond, bond fund, general obligation bonds for airport purposes in order to make some improvements at the airport. We made three efforts to pass an airport bond issue before the fourth effort was successfully passed. And that was the beginning in 1960, 1960 I believe, was our first bond fund that passed. In 1961, we passed the second one. The first one was passed for five million. The second one was passed for seven and a half million. And that was the beginning of our uh, expanded program at Will Rogers Field. The old airport was uh, located at Southwest 29th Street and May Avenue. And that was where Braniff began their first flight of the Braniff International Airways from from that old grass strip now known as Woodson Park. In 1931, the Chamber of Commerce came out way out here on Meridian and Southwest 59th Street and bought one section of land, 640 acres. And 
we had a small bond issue at that time and built the old terminal building. It was dedicated in April 1932. We built the hangar to the south of the old tunnel and the two hangars to the north of the old tunnel. And that was known in those days as Municipal Airport. And it was dedicated Will Rogers Airport in December 1941, just before Pearl Harbor. Then, in uh, 1950, 1962, we rededicated this airfield as Will Rogers World Airport, the name that it holds today. Uh, a man who has done a great deal for Oklahoma City, Stanley Draper, head of the Chamber of Commerce, asked me one day, you're going to have an air, you're going to have a airport bond issue for $5 million. What are you going to do with all that money? I said, buy some land. One thing we want to do. And he asked me how much land we intended to buy. I said, about 3,000 acres. And the man with the imagination of Stanley Draper said, my gosh, what are you going to do with all that land? Well, of course, as it turns out, 3,000 acres was not sufficient, and we had to buy more with the following year's airport bond fund. Until today, we own almost uh, 7,000 acres. When we complete our land acquisition program, that we have underway now. We will have 7,500 acres. This will make us the second largest airport in area in the world. Dulles Airport in Washington, D.C., owned by the federal government, is the largest airport with 10,100 acres. Now, of course, I hear that our friends to the south here Dallas Fort Worth are going to do it up Texas style. They're going to build, they're going to buy 22,000 acres to build a new airport on, but that hasn't happened yet. So, as of today, we're the second largest in the area in the world. We need more land to the east and to the west, being our lateral sides of the north south runway for noise abatement purposes. But uh, we uh, have beautiful, clear, clear approach zones, and our reputation is spreading all over the country. And it's going to pay off someday by having all types of industry come to Oklahoma City. Well, it's been a marvelous story of the foresight that's gone into making this, a, as, somewhat, as it's sometimes called, I guess, a super airport. Uh, well, in the making this uh, dream a reality, what was the what was the key to making all this materialize? The bond issues, or what? The bond issues, basically. In 1956, the Federal Aviation Agency, the FAA, had established the Aeronautical Center here for the purpose of training the FAA people to become air traffic control people to man the towers around the world or wherever the American flag was flown, how to maintain and equip the navigation instruments that you find on the airfields. And they needed more training room, more Space. In other words, they needed buildings. Well, the city again found themselves without any money. And under state law, they could not issue revenue bonds or any bonds of any type. 
so at that time the Oklahoma City Apple Trust was founded for the sole purpose of issuing revenue bonds and spending money for the development of such things as the Aeronautical Center. The development of the trust, the Oklahoma City Airport Trust, was done by virtue of legislation passed by the state legislature, which made the trust a, an agency of the state government. They had the power to pass, to issue and sell revenue producing bonds and in this manner of financing they construct they had now constructed about thirty four million dollars in buildings at the Aeronautical Center. They're a beautiful set of buildings. The federal government has them under lease and they pay a rent that will retire the bonds in twenty years from the date they were issued which means that the buildings will be completely paid for in 20 years and the city will own them free of any encumbrance. In the meantime, the federal government will continue to have a need for those buildings and they'll uh, pay an adequate rent for them. They're well constructed. Now the work of the Oklahoma City Airport Trust is being expanded. By that I mean we only had two and a half million dollars to build this new terminal building to the east and south of the old terminal building. But the building was going to cost six and six and one half million dollars. So that left us shy of four million dollars. The Oklahoma City Airport Trust issued revenue bonds for the $4 million added to the GO bonds for $2.5 million gave us enough money to build the terminal building. We used uh, GO bonds plus federal FAA matching money to build an apron that cost a million and a half dollars. Also we built a new parallel north-south runway on the east side of the new terminal building here, 5,000 feet east of the old runway that cost two and a half million dollars. That was done with matching funds from the government. And uh, we now have uh, a beautiful term, new terminal building that will take care of our needs between 1965 and 1975. I don't think that anyone can provide room, provide a building that will last <clears throat> longer than 10 years in an industry as dynamic as this is. Therefore, we concluded to build for 10 years only. The plan is halfway in between this decade, during halfway into this decade, 1970 for example, we're supposed to take a new reading. Do we need more gate positions? Do we need more building expansion? Do we need more auto parking in our parking garage? If so, we have five years between 1970 and 75 in which to find the money, draw the plans, hire the contract, and get it built by the time 1975 comes along, and then we should be set for another 10-year period. If we continue operating on, these, on this decade plan and continue to expand as the need might require, we'll be able to halfway keep up with the growing aviation industry, meaning passengers and cargo. Passenger traffic is uh, in the midst of a terrific increase, but uh, air cargo 
will soon overtake passenger traffic. And like all modes of transportation, I think hauling freight will eventually wind up as being the prime objective of the airplane rather than hauling passengers. Take a look at what's happened to sailing vessels. They catered during the old Titanic days, they catered to passengers going back and forward to Europe. Today, they don't haul many passengers, they haul freight. Railroads, they used to have deluxe Pullmans and deluxe with bars and club rooms on the trains, <coughs> deluxe accommodations of all types. Today, they're trying to get rid of the passenger trains, trying to get Interstate Commerce Commission to allow them to drop the passenger trains, but don't you dare touch a panel of that freight unless you want a big fight, because that's the thing that rings the cash register the loudest, is that freight. I think the same thing will happen in aviation. I think that uh, air cargo will grow to such a statue that it will be the biggest factor in aviation and uh, the passenger will find, have to find some other fast and different mode of transportation. I was looking a long way down the line, most of us, had, most of us uh, I never thought that far be in keeping with the trend of what's happened in the past. Well, this has been a marvelous interview, and you've given us the inside story, and it'll be a great asset. The tape will be more valuable every, every year. Thank you, Mr. Ross. Anything, anything further you want to say? I don't believe there's anything more that I could add. <laughs>